All right, continuing on with the TMCC Library Open Genealogy Lab Outstanding Guest Speaker Series, today we are pleased to present Jonathan Fairchild. Jonathan is the historian at Homestead National Park in Beatrice, Nebraska. His responsibilities include providing research and reference assistance, preserving and protecting park cultural resources, and interpreting the significance of the Homestead Act on United States history. Today's program, Black Homesteaders on the Great Plains, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness explores how Black settlers use the Homestead Act as an opportunity to achieve the American dream. The Homestead Act of 1862 helped at least 3,400 Black farmers build homes across the Great Plains. In this lesson, students will learn from a park ranger how Black African Americans gained life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through the homesteading. So I would like to offer a warm virtual welcome to Jonathan. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. All right, so I'm actually going to pop off the screen here so you can see the slides behind me a little bit better. There we go. So there is a deeply American story, a story of migration, risk-taking, immense toil, hardship, sacrifice, and courage in the face of long odds within the history of the Homestead Act. It's a story that until recently has been largely untold and very nearly lost. And that story, of course, is the history of Black homesteading. President Abraham Lincoln signed several important laws in the summer of 1862, which went into effect the following year on January 1st, 1863. One of these, of course, was the Homestead Act, which opened up public lands for actual settlements. The other was the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that, quote, all persons held as slaves are and henceforward shall be free. So that proclamation, which established the total abolition of slavery as a union war goal, also put African Americans on the road to citizenship, uh, which is very important in becoming able to homestead after the Civil War. So after the Civil War and emancipation, Black homesteaders arrived in the Great Plains. They sought to build new lives, provide for their families, and to educate their children. They especially sought to own their own land. They knew how to farm, and they saw land ownership as being central to their freedom and equality in the United States. Before we really dive in, I want to contextualize what exactly the Homestead Act was. So it was signed into law on May 20th, 1862 by President Lincoln in order to promote westward settlement across the United States. It allowed any adult citizen or someone who declared their intent to become a citizen uh, the ability to become a landowner for free. It granted up to 160 acres of land to anyone eligible, so long as they met the requirements listed here on your screen. So you had to have never borne arms against the United States. Uh, that was later repealed after Reconstruction. You had to be 21 years old or the head of a household. You had to be a citizen or declare your intent to become one. You had to establish actual residence, meaning building a house or dwelling on that land and living in it uh, for at least a five-year period as you proved up your claim. You had to cultivate at least 10 acres of land. And you had to pay a modest filing fee of about $14. So you can see the map here, those states in brown, those are all the homesteading states. So it goes all the way from Florida in the far southeast to Alaska. Quite a bit of the United States was eligible to be homesteaded. So when the Homestead Act was signed into law, of course, the Civil War was raging, right? 1862 took effect in 1863. I mentioned that African Americans were not immediately eligible to homestead as they were not yet considered to be citizens. Uh, but even so, they served in the Union military in large numbers, approximately 180,000 in the Army and about another 20,000 in the Navy. They made up 10% of the Union Army, serving in the infantry, the artillery, as well as many non combatant roles. Though Black women were not formally allowed in the Army at that time, many served as nurses, spies, and scouts. For example, Harriet Tubman herself famously served as a spy during the war. Many soldiers in the United States colored troops were those who self-emancipated, individuals who escaped from bondage and sought to fight against the institution of slavery. So after the Civil War, when the uh, 13th Amendment was ratified in 1865, it officially abolished slavery nationwide, and the 14th Amendment ratified in 1868, provided citizenship to African Americans, so they were now able to claim land 
under the Homestead Act of 1862, but there was actually also a, a special homestead law that passed after the Civil War that was specifically aimed at helping Blacks gain access to land. Black homesteaders were drawn to the Great Plains by the promise of land under the Homestead Act, but they were also pushed away from the South, pushed by the bitter agony of the suffering of slavery and by the failures of land reform there under Reconstruction. So at first, many expected to be granted farms when General William Sherman issued an order with the approval of Lincoln promising 40 acres of former plantation land seized by the Union Army. That hope was crushed after Lincoln's assassination and President Andrew Johnson rescinded the order. But in 1866, Congress passed the Southern Homestead Act, which opened up about 46 million acres of public lands in Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, and Mississippi. So this special version of the Homestead Act allowed claims of 80 acres for a $5 fee and explicitly prohibited discrimination by race or color. So Congress saw this law as an opportunity to transform the rural South from a plantation economy to a society of black and white land-owning small farmers. There was enough land for hundreds of thousands of homesteads, and black homesteaders were given a special six-month window where they were the only ones allowed to claim land under this law. Normally, homesteading was administered by the General Land Office, which is part of the Department of the Interior, which is also the parent department of the National Park Service. Uh, but the Southern Homestead Act was administered by the Freedmen's Bureau, which was under the Department of War. The Freedmen's Bureau was unfortunately overworked and understaffed. They had many programs and tasks to attempt to provide aid to Southern Blacks, which meant that resources to distribute land under the Southern Homestead Act weren't all they could be. In total, somewhere around 36,000 freed persons lived on around 6,000 farms successfully granted under the Southern Homestead Act, which was about 1% of the Black population uh, before the Southern Homestead Act was repealed in 1876. The shortcomings uh, come down to a couple of big factors. So most Ameri uh, African Americans were extremely poor and they lacked the resources to move to public lands and establish new farms. The available land was not really easily converted to farming either. A lot of it was heavily forested, so it was both time-consuming and expensive to be able to convert that to something you could actually farm on. And then the land offices were few and far between, and surveys and maps of the land were not widely available to claimants. So even finding a homestead and, and filing a claim on it could be tough. And then finally, Black homesteaders in the South were subjected to Southern white hostility and violence. Uh, some Southern whites attempted to prevent Southern Blacks from acquiring land under the Homestead Act. So given those obstacles, uh, racism and poverty, I think that the Southern Homestead Act can be seen as at least a relative success and that those who claim land under it showed great courage and determination. So my park, Homestead National Historical Park, has been working on a Black homesteader project for several years now. We've been working in partnership with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and the University of Oklahoma to explore the Black homesteading experience in the Great Plains. It started off looking at the states you can see here on the map, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico. Our research found that at least 26,000 African-Americans settled in those states under the Homestead Act, beginning in the late 1870s. The project studied both independent homesteaders, those who went off and settled on their own, and those who homesteaded in groups or colonies of homesteads. Both individuals and colonies had a success rate of over 50%, similar to national averages. Colonies or group settlement tended to be preferred. Uh, homesteading was difficult and having friends and neighbors in your community that you could count on was very important. Those independent Black homesteaders faced some tough obstacles. One of them, of course, was the isolation and loneliness that all homesteaders felt, amplified with the difficulty in meeting and finding spouses and partners. Many independent Black homesteaders might be the only African-Americans around for miles, 
and racist laws preventing interracial marriage in the U.S., which was legal until 1967, made it difficult to meet a potential partner. Though each community was different, in some places, many Blacks had difficulties forming friendship and receiving assistance from other local farmers. Uh, it could be difficult to receive bank loans or financial support and assistance, and some experienced theft, violence, and racial hostility. So we'll take a look at some of the independent Black homesteaders on the Great Plains. Here we can see Robert Ball Anderson, who was born into slavery in Kentucky. His mother was torn from his life when he was young, sold away. He escaped to freedom during the Civil War and joined the Union Army. He served with the 125th Colored Infantry, and following the end of the Civil War, his regiment was sent to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. He also served with the Buffalo Soldiers in New Mexico, Texas, and Colorado. After his military service, he took an 80-acre homestead claim in Butler County, Nebraska, which he successfully proved up in 1875. But several years of drought, low farm prices, and grasshopper plagues uh, meant that he lost his claim in 1881 and spent the next several years as a farmhand in Kansas. He ended up heading for western Nebraska in 1884 and took a timber culture claim, which was similar to the Homestead Act, uh, but for planting trees rather than raising crops. He was able to add some more land that way. He ended up with a prosperous ranch in Nebraska, uh, owning 2,000 acres of land by 1918. He had as many as 50 head of horses and was at that point considered to be the wealthiest Black man in Nebraska. He escaped the racial prejudice of the South, but the area he lived in Nebraska in 1910 had a Black population in the whole county of about 50, uh, under 1% of the total population, most of whom were laborers who had come to the area as railroad workers. He lived near Hemingford, which is an exclusively white town, although they did tend to accept him. He had a good military record and was a successful rancher and farmer. And one of his neighbors said, uh, if there ever was a gentleman, if I've ever known one, it was Robert Anderson. So here we can see George Washington Carver, who was born into slavery in Missouri in the closing days of the Civil War. He, his mother, and his sister were kidnapped and sold in Kentucky when he was just a baby, and he would never see his mother again, and his father died before he was born. He ended up moving to Kansas to pursue an education. He applied and was accepted to Highland University, but when he arrived, the university refused to let him attend because of his race. He then decided to homestead a claim in Kansas, where he built and furnished a sod house. He took out a loan to commute, or purchase outright his homestead claim instead of staying on it for five years uh, to immediately receive the title to the land, and then sold his homestead and used the remaining funds to invest in an education, launching his career as the most famous American agricultural scientist. He made his way to Iowa, where he attended Simpson College and then Iowa Agricultural College, earning a Master of Science degree in 1896, and became the first African-American faculty member at Iowa State. He left Iowa for a position at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, which is a college established for Black students by Booker T. Washington. It was at Tuskegee where he made his greatest strides in developing both agricultural and industrial products. He famously created over 300 uses for peanuts, 100 uses for sweet potatoes, and 75 products derived from pecans. He also developed a rubber substitute and hundreds of dyes and pigments from 20 different plants. Shortly after his death in 1943, his birthplace in Missouri was designated as George Washington Carver National Monument, which is still administered today by the National Park Service. Here we can see independent Black homesteader Oscar Michaud. Like many Black homesteaders, his parents were born enslaved in Kentucky. They moved across the Ohio River to Illinois, where Oscar was born in 1884. His family had an 80-acre farm where they grew wheat and corn, and as a young man, he left the farm to travel to South Dakota in 1904, where he participated in a land lottery. But with more than 100,000 claimants for only 2,400 homesteads, he wasn't able to win one directly in the drawing, so he ended up purchasing a relinquished homestead, 
land that someone else had abandoned. After some success as a homesteader on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, a three-year drought destroyed his crops. So he ended up writing down his experience as a homesteader to cope with the hardships that he was going through and to tell the story of his struggle with and what he felt was his conquest of the land. He began traveling throughout the area selling his book, The Conquest, to his friends and neighbors. This led to a second novel titled The Homesteader. These books caught the attention of a production company that wanted to turn them into a movie. So in 1919, he adapted the story into a film, becoming the first known African-American filmmaker and director. Though The Homesteader in 1919 is considered to be a lost film, it launched Michaud's career. Over 30 years, he made more than 40 films, and his work has been preserved by the Library of Congress and the National Film Registry as culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. So I mentioned the tough obstacles that independent Black homesteaders face, the isolation, loneliness, difficulty of meeting partners, and the, the, those struggles. So in the face of that, you can see why many would consider forming communities. Let's take a look at these quotes on the screen here. So the top one is from John Davis, a white farmer who exhibited a, a white supremacist view of homesteading, claiming that it required, quote, men of exceptional enterprise will go into dugouts and make homes for themselves by their own muscles. Such homes can be made and are made but it requires the energy and patience of the Northern European to do it successfully. William Lewis, who was the publisher of the first Black-owned newspaper of Kansas, refuted that claim, explaining how important the Homestead Act could be for Black Americans, saying, quote, the Homestead Act could mean that there's no longer a need for our people to remain in the abominable South, to be the slaves of the rebels and targets for the muskets of white men. So Black homesteaders sought to create these communities for unity and companionship and mutual benefit. Some of the most important and significant were at Nicodemus, Kansas, DeWitty, Nebraska, Deerfield, Colorado, Empire, Wyoming, Sully County, South Dakota, and Blackdom, New Mexico. They provided strength in numbers, Black leadership, schools, cooperation and farm work, uh, witnesses for paperwork, and better marriage prospects, all sorts of things. Nicodemus in Kansas was specifically established to create an all-Black community by the Nicodemus Town Company. 30 members arrived from Topeka in the summer of 1877 to plat out a town and then recruited colonists from Kentucky to homestead around that central town site. But when a group of 300 colonists arrived from Kentucky, some of them weren't impressed. Upon seeing what they felt was, quote, a, a bleak, treeless landscape, a small, dreary town, and what looked like severely limited prospects. So, in fact, 60 of those families went back immediately. But successive waves of settlers kept arriving over the next few years, most of whom claimed homesteads. Their initial houses out there on the plains were dugouts and sod houses as there was very little timber or money available for anything more than that. Uh, but even with that, the very first school was established in 1877, the first year of Nicodemus. Even when the community was poor and struggling, their main priority was education and providing their children uh, with an opportunity that they had been denied. Uh, education, along with property ownership, was seen as the key to obtaining a full equality in the post-Civil War United States. The biggest celebration of the year in Nicodemus was, and still is today, Emancipation Day, celebrating liberation from slavery. It's held annually to this day, although now is referred to as Homecoming Day. In the town of Nicodemus itself, there was a large level of racial cooperation and harmony. Town life was biracial with a black majority and a small white minority living, working, socializing, and recreating together. When the town was first created, many hoped that it'd be named as the county seat, which would have greatly supported its economic base, but it ended up losing out to another city. A few years later, they campaigned to have the railroad drive through the town, again hoping to boost the town's economic futures. The towns in the Great Plains sprung up entirely around railroad lines, and in many ways, the future of a town 
was determined by whether you received that railroad or not. Losing out on the railroad like they did was a tough blow, and the population has slowly declined since the turn of the 20th century. But even so, it, it continues as a community today and is the site of a National Park Service site telling the story of Black Home Sitting. DeWitty was founded in Cherry County, Nebraska in 1904 by African-American and African-Canadian settlers. One factor attracting homesteaders to Cherry County was the Kincaid Act, which was a special amendment to the Homestead Act, which allowed the opportunity to claim a total of 640 acres, or a full section of land, four times as much as you normally could. A small group, including Charles Meehan and his African-American wife, Hester Meehan, established a settlement which continued to grow uh, through family ties and kinship networks. The settlement grew in phases with groups of individuals from around the company or uh, country coming in. 11 settlers filed in 1907, and by 1929, there were about 60 claims on nearly 30,000 acres. It reached its population peak of around 150 in 1915, a number which seems small until you realize that under the Kincaid Act, if you were claiming that much land, 640 acres, then your nearest neighbor was a full mile away. So it was a much more rural community than Nicodemus. There was never a central town center, and it was never incorporated. Essentially, it was a cluster of rural farms gathered together for mutual benefit and assistance. Pictured here is George Riley who was a homesteader and member of the DeWitty Sluggers baseball team. Though Major League Baseball didn't integrate until Jackie Robinson signed with the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947, interracial baseball was prevalent in the Great Plains at a time when social interaction between African Americans and whites was virtually non-existent. Homesteaders could watch games between local all-black teams as well as barnstorming teams that challenged local white teams. The colony of DeWitty supported not one but two baseball teams, the North Loop Sluggers and the Yellow Jackets, which both played against other local teams. The Sluggers were managed by George Riley and lost very few games and were known for their entertaining style of play, so sort of like the Harlem Globetrotters in basketball. Avis B. Stay, whose family homesteaded in both DeWitty, Nebraska and Empire, Wyoming, recalled, quote, they would let the opposing team win right back up to the bottom of the ninth and then come way back and defeat the heck out of them. A local white rancher backed that story up, recalling that the North Loop Sluggers, quote, could beat everyone around. They played everybody and they beat everybody. So here we can see the map of the community of DeWitty. Each of the squares or sections here is that 640 acres. So again, under the Kincaid Act, you could receive much more than a quarter section or a quarter of these squares. Uh, the story of Dowdy, though, is no different than most of the other rural Nebraska Sandhills communities. They were very prosperous in the early 1900s, especially with the profitable years of World War I bringing high crop prices. But an agricultural depression in the 1920s before the stock market crash, the Great Depression, and the Dust Bowl caused farms around the country to fail. Though ranches in the area were quite successful, farming in the Sand Hills generally wasn't, and DeWitty never really made the switch from farming to ranching. In any case, many residents saw DeWitty not as a permanent settlement, but almost as a, a way station in this process of upward mobility, a place to educate their children and grandchildren and provide them with the tools they need to succeed in life so they could go on to become healthcare workers and educators and government employees. And then once they were in a better financial uh, position, uh, were able to leave to find better farming areas. So it was a success, not in the sense that it was a lasting community, but that it provided opportunity and advancement for its residents. Further west on the Great Plains was the community of Deerfield, Colorado, which was created by Oliver Toussaint Jackson in 1911 who used his homestead to claim of 320 acres to form the initial settlement. His tireless promotion resulted in residents building 44 wooden houses, two churches, a schoolhouse, a doctor's office, a factory, and a filling station in the first few years of the community. 
By 1918, it was a vibrant, successful place. Jackson remained Deerfield's central figure, and his entrepreneurial spirit grew as the community flourished. He helped many of the new homesteaders, some of whom had previous little agricultural experience. As the town grew, he opened a community center, and at its peak, it had about 300 residents. Just like uh, DeWitty, it prospered in World War I years as demand and prices for farm goods stayed high, but the post-war years were difficult with drought and collapsing farm prices, and most of the residents left to seek work in the city. Jackson remained rebranding Deerfield as a resort for African-Americans visiting from Denver, and in World War II offered to sell the town to the federal government. Both plans failed, and most of the town was torn down and the lumber of the building was reused. Jackson and his wife Minerva remained, and his house built in 1918 still stands, though it's in great disrepair. Blackton was the most important homesteading colony in New Mexico. It was incorporated by Frank Boyer and 12 others with the Blackton Town Site Company in 1903. Initially, they had some difficulty attracting homesteaders to the desert, with rainfall being sparse during those years and the cost of irrigating crops being very high. Uh, but about 1909, more started coming to join the community. Uh, 64 individuals end up successfully proving homestead claims between 1907 and 1927, uh, getting a total of about 13,000 acres. It had its own post office and several substantial buildings. Life in the community of Blackton revolved around work, religious activities, and their school. Uh, like other Black communities, prized education and hired educated people from uh, outside to come be a part of their community as teachers. In 1919, oil was discovered in the region, and many landowners pooled their mineral rights to lease to oil companies. Starting in the 1920s, Blackdom began to empty out, although uh, the oil leases provided homesteaders there with sufficient revenues to seek better lives elsewhere. Members of three different intermarried Nebraska families, the Speeses, the Taylors, and the Shores, founded Empire, Wyoming in 1908. They were worried that their holdings in Nebraska were insufficient to support growing future generations, and so they were attracted to the larger tracts of land available further west. Uh, the Empire homesteaders, unlike some other Black homesteaders, arrived with substantial financial resources and farming experience. And uh, proved up on about 10 homesteads. Uh, it was a smaller community, about 60 or so residents, uh, but like the others, though small, uh, built a school and hired teachers. Pictured here is Reverend Russell Taylor, who was a Presbyterian minister and homesteader in Empire. He moved to the community in 1911 with his wife Henriette and their children to claim a homestead. He was Empire's postmaster, as well as its religious and educational leader. He assumed leadership of the school shortly after he arrived and believed that children had the right to learn from a role model and said that none of his white teachers nor his school books had ever taught him anything about the accomplishments of Blacks. He advocated for African Americans at local political meetings and in state and even national forums. He was also active in neighboring communities in Scottsbluff, Nebraska uh, to raise uh, concerns about working conditions. His brother, Baseman Taylor, died while in the custody of Goshen County Sheriffs in 1913, and the death left the small community shocked and dispirited. By the end of the decade, the community had largely emptied out, with many returning to Nebraska. I thought I'd share some of the ongoing work with the Black Homesteader Project. So during the research that we did on these Great Plains communities, we learned that there may have been more Black homesteaders in Oklahoma than in any other state, but Oklahoma was out of the scope of that initial research project. So now we've partnered with both the University of Nebraska and the University of Oklahoma to learn more about that Oklahoma Black homesteading experience. We're also working with genealogists and the descendants of homesteaders all over the country uh, to help share their stories. 
We invite descendants to share pictures, memories, stories, uh, post them up on our website to, to celebrate the rich and diverse history of homesteading in America. Of course, it wasn't just the Great Plains where African Americans staked claims to land. Pictured here is Mahala Ashley Dickerson, who homesteaded independently in Alaska. She was born in Montgomery, Alabama in 1912, and she was actually a childhood friend of Rosa Parks. She pursued her education, receiving a law degree in 1945 from Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C., one of the nation's most prestigious Black universities. She returned to Alabama, where she became the first Black female lawyer in the state in 1948, and she made a name for herself representing people who faced discrimination. In the 1950s, she took a vacation to Alaska, where she fell in love with the landscape and decided to stay for good. She filed a claim for a 160-acre homestead in the Matanuska Valley near Wasilla in 1958. She was Alaska's first female Black homesteader. A few months later, she passed the bar exam and became the first Black lawyer in Alaska. She was known for her inspired defense of her clients. In one of her most notable trials, she won a precedent-setting case for female faculty members at the University of Alaska, showing that women there received lower pay than their male counterparts. She received many different legal honors throughout her career and served as the president of the National Association of Women Lawyers in 1983 and 1984, and in 1995 received the Margaret Brent Award, honoring her as among the most outstanding American female lawyers. Dunbar was a Black homesteader community in the Landfair Valley of California. Its residents were attracted to the promise of free land, but they also sought to escape the racist and often violent discrimination of coastal California cities. Black homesteaders there earned rights to their land at impressive rates, which some attributed to their high levels of communal work. Dunbar was named after the poet, novelist, and playwright Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who was an African-American icon, and his former house is a National Park Service site in Ohio. Farming in the desert wasn't easy. It received less than 10 inches of rain per year, so wells had to be dug up to hundreds of feet deep, which many homesteaders couldn't afford. So water for irrigation and household use often needed to be fetched from springs miles away. With hard work, settlers were able to grow modest harvests of corn, wheat, milo, and beans. A one-room school was built in 1913, where Black and white pupils settled, uh, studied together as equals, which was unusual at the time. Former homesteaders remember families of different races helping each other work in the fields and visiting each other's houses, though segregation did still occur for certain social events. The population of the valley dwindled in the 1920s, and there were no permanent residents after 1946. Overall, between 150 and 175 homesteads were proved up, including 25 by African Americans. After receiving the patent to their land, some chose to sell to cattle ranchers immediately and use the money to pursue dreams elsewhere, determining success not by whether their children continued the family farm, but how well they equipped their children with money, education, and skills needed to succeed. Of course, some did hold on to their land, when the Mojave National Preserve was created in the 1990s, over 70,000 acres of land were still privately owned. Allensworth, California was an all-Black colony founded in Tulare County, California by Colonel Allen Allensworth. Like the other settlements in this program, it was designed as a, a refuge, a place for Black settlement away from racial discrimination and violence. Alan Allensworth was born into slavery in Kentucky in 1842, self-emancipated during the Civil War, and joined the Union Navy. After the war, he served with the Buffalo Soldiers as the chaplain, retiring during the Spanish-American War as a lieutenant colonel, the highest rank achieved by an African-American at that time. Allensworth was heavily promoted. It had a 20-acre central town site purchased from the Pacific Farming Company in order to have a town available on the railroad line. The California Colony and Home Promoting Association spread news of the community far and wide over the next several years. You can see a newspaper clipping here from a Denver, Colorado paper in April 1911, declaring it, quote, the Allen Collinsworth, uh, uh, excuse me, the Allensworth Colony a wonder, 
It had nearly 4,000 acres of farmland, a church, a school, three stores, a post office, a hotel, and it, of course, the Santa Fe Railroad. The article raved about its artesian wells providing water, and the land as being, quote, some of the richest land in the state. Though the community was not predominantly homesteaders, it did have members with homestead claims and other public land claims, like that of Oscar Over, pictured here who received 160 acres of land under the Homestead Act, successfully receiving his claim in 1920. His wife, Cora Over, received land under the similar Desert Land Act, acquiring a further 160 acres in her own name. Their neighbors were also homesteaders, but much of the community was centered around the town site and didn't directly homestead. The Homestead Act forever changed American history when it took effect on January 1st, 1863. Millions of homesteaders settled land across 30 states over 123 years. Their stories have remained largely untold. So Homestead National Historical Park is working to collect and to share these stories. To celebrate the fact that the Homestead Act went into effect 160 years ago this year, we'll be sharing 160 stories of homesteaders from all around the country on social media and our park website all year long. You can follow along from home. We also invite you to join in the fun. If you're a homesteader descendant, we'd love to have you share your family history with us. So to wrap up, Black people successfully homesteaded in all Great Plains states and indeed all across America. Somewhere around 26,000 Black people participated in Great Plains homesteading, gaining ownership of more than hundreds of thousands of acres. About a thousand of them were independent homesteaders, including Robert Ball Anderson, George Washington Carver, and the early Black filmmaker Oscar Michaud. But the majority were located in rural communities or colonies, including the ones I've talked about today. These communities opened up new opportunities education, trade, services, churches, schools, sporting events, etc. They were linked closely to one another through kinship, marriage, and business ties. Despite their heroic efforts due to factors beyond their control, most of them no longer exist today, only Nicodemus, Kansas remains. But that doesn't mean that they were not successful or that they failed. Black people came to the Great Plains seeking to find a refuge from violence and repression and racism, which they had been subjected to in the South. They came to Homestead to own land, to build new lives. The Homestead Act was a vehicle by which they could achieve this dream. So it's a remarkable story of success, of Black achievement, of American achievement. Their goals of finding that relief, of building viable farms, educating their children and equipping them for successful lives. You know, to some white homesteaders, maybe the proudest boast was, uh, I'm the fourth or fifth or sixth generation to own this land, to farm this land. But to many Black homesteaders, it was, you know, we've escaped the trauma of slavery, of racial violence in the South. We've provided a better future for our children. We've sent them out. We were successful. We made it. And the Homestead Act was a big, big part of why that happened. All right. Thank you, everyone. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Wonderful. Thank you very much, John. Um, okay, class, I'm opening up to the uh, forum here. So if, one at a time, please uh, unmute your microphone, leave your camera off and go ahead and ask the question. While I'm waiting for uh, the class to go ahead and, and uh, get their questions together, I have a couple. You mentioned that you're partnering with the University of uh, Nebraska Lincoln and the University of Oklahoma. Um, what exactly? What departments are you working with there? Is it uh, is it sociology? Is it history? Is it anthropology? You know what what who, who is helping you do the research? Yeah, so at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, we're working with the Center for Great Plains Studies, and. Uh, at the University of Oklahoma, it's through the, the history department there is the Oklahoma Black History Project, or the, the Oklahoma Black Homesteader Project. Wonderful. Okay. Now, just because I work at a college, you know, I'm always interested in, in partnerships, you know, between, you know, different entities and in, in the school. Um, how did you reach out to them? I mean, what, what, you know, what was the mechanism you used? I mean, at what point, was it just a concept that you reached out to them and then made it happen? 
So, like I said, this project has been going for years and years now, and it was originally created. Uh, basically, the National Park Service occasionally puts out projects saying, you know, we're doing this big history project and would love to partner with someone. And uh, then universities can apply and say, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll work with you on that. Okay. Now, Oh, what is the actual research process? I mean, you, you gave us a lot of really wonderful information today with, you know, names and dates and, and even plat mats and a uh, plat map and so on. Um, what is the, tell us about the research process. You know, how did you discover who the homesteaders were? I mean, what did the park start it or did they delegate that to the universities? You know, was it census records? How did you recompile all the information? Yeah. So, uh, the most important resource for that uh, comes from homesteading case files. So whenever someone homesteaded, uh, that five-year process, essentially you had to prove to the federal government that you were making good on your homestead, that you were uh, proving it up is the term. And so the records from that are all still kept in the National Archives. Uh, so you would have your receipts, you'd have your affidavits, your witness testimony, you'd have newspaper records. Um, you'd have even vital records, things like military service. Uh, if you're an immigrant, you'd have naturalization records. If there were legal disputes, any, uh, you know, fighting over the, the parcel of land that you're claiming, all of that ends up in that case file. And so with the Black Homesteader Project, uh, the general land office records, when, when they sent out a patent, you know, there's no way of indicating directly on that patent whether someone was African-American or not. So a lot of that would have to be cross-referenced with, with census data. So it was going through both of those together, cross-referencing to determine whether or not someone was a Black homesteader. And how would one go about getting a copy of that original package? So some of them are digitized. Uh, they're available online through Ancestry has most of them. Uh, Family Search has Nebraska and um, no, excuse me. Uh, Fold three has Nebraska and Family Search, I believe, has Arizona. Uh, but if you're not in one of those 10 states that are currently digitized, you'd have to get them directly from the National Archives. And you can request that with an NATF 84 film. And that's available on the National Archives website? Mm -hmm. Excuse me. I think most of this information is available on the Bureau of Land Management uh, patent records. And you can just log on to that because that's the way I've gotten all mine. Yeah, so the Bureau of Land Management's database, the, the General Land Office records, is an excellent uh, first stop. So that's like an index of all public land, uh, whether it's homestead, military bounty lands, uh, mining lands, uh, just cash sales. So all of that is indexed there. You can see, you know, name, the date, the place, map it out and everything. Uh, but specifically for case files, so the, the like packets of information, that would still be in the National Archives or on Ancestry. Yes, but you can order them through the Bureau of Land Management. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Now, as a genealogy librarian, I'm always interested in in purchasing books for our, our genealogy book collection here in our library. Uh, and today's presentation was just I, I just thought found it very just fascinating and very, very interesting. Um, do you does your uh, visitor center sell books that you know the kind of covers what you just covered? Uh, we do. We actually have a, a book that was created from. Uh, some of this research by the Center for Great Plains Studies. And, and do you know offhand what the title of the book is? Uh, it's called Homesteading the Plains Toward a New History. Thank you. Um, I know I bought for our library a lot of the Arcadia publishing titles, you know, that, that cover like, you know, different communities. Do you know whether any of the communities that you uh, covered in today's presentation have an Arcadia publishing uh, a book about that? You know, they, they, they specialize in, in uh, small communities, the history of small communities. So I don't recall who it was published through, uh, but one of the people that we work with on our Black Homesteader Project uh, did publish a book 
I think late last year on Black Homesteading in the South. And I can provide you a, a link to that if you'd like. Wonderful. Let's see if I can find the title of it here. And I, while you're finding it, I just wanted to point out that uh, Dreema in the chat box, she asked, is the National Park Service providing this data on their website? And John, thank you for your response. You can get that uh, information at nps.gov slash home. That's right. Here we go. I, I sent a link to that book. Uh, so Bernice Bennett, and it was Arcadia Publishing. Uh, her book is Black Homesteaders of the South. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I kind of suspected if the books existed, it would be through Arcadia Publishing. Uh, oh, Bridget posted in the in the uh, uh, chat box. She said we had a children's book on uh, Nico Demas, Kansas, in the 1980s. My son's 41 now, and sorry to say, I don't have the book any longer. Wow, that's very cool. Now, I really enjoyed, you know, one of the big things with doing family history is, you know, if you're lucky enough to find those old photographs of your families, much less multi-generational, I noticed that, that at least one of the photos that you showed was multi-generational. Uh, is there a backstory to that photo? Uh, which one? Uh, it was, this, I think it was like people uh, showed like a family standing outside of their house and there was adults and children. Was that the first picture, Suzanne? I don't remember if it was the first one, but it was just a wonderful old black and white photo of like an entire family. It looks like multi-generational. It was the um, first picture, and he also repeated it at the end. Yeah. I believe the one you're talking about is from DeWitty, Nebraska. Was that donated to your, you know, to your park as like a part of like history retention by the family or, uh, you know, is there a backstory to it? I'm just wondering. Uh, so that was collected as part of the Black Home Center research by the Center for Great Plains Studies. So they actually went out and did uh, oral history interviews with some of the descendants. And a lot of the pictures in this program uh, came from those descendants. Now, do you know where the oral histories are stored? Is it on StoryCorps uh, through the Library of Congress or how, how are those oral histories stored? Can anyone so, access them? We have them here at the park in our archive. Are those digital where we can log on and listen to them? Not yet, but we are working on that. So, hi, this is Wendy and I was the one that met you with my, with my daughter. And um, my grandparents um, and family all, they homesteaded in Phillipsburg, Kansas. And they would, my grandpa would always tell us about Nicodemus and how, um, you know, how it was such a neat community and how the, um, the African-American families had established that. But I, I remember my grandpa telling me that as a little girl. And then when I visited, I would go past there. So that was pretty neat to see, so, yeah. But how yeah. how are you picking how are you picking families um, for your what did you say three uh, hundred no one hundred and sixty one hundred and fifty stories yeah, the, the one sixty of one sixty campaign yes uh, so we're just accepting submissions from anyone who's the descendant of a homesteader we've still got oh uh, I think about sixty that we're we're looking to fill so happy to accept any stories coming from descendants and. You know, we're creating a, a, a website, including you know, if their pictures, awesome. If not, including stories and the, the general land office records, you know, the, the patent information, um, and then sharing those stories up on our social media accounts. Okay, so I saw what you said, you know, that um, Nebraska's uh, information was online. That's, that's interesting because I have family on the other side from there. But the ones in Kansas, I'm still trying to find patents and trying, I've ordered one because I needed it for my Mayflower descendant, but I would love to love to be part of that. And so could you give us the link to that or how we apply or? Um, yeah, so you can the, just email uh, information like to share directly to us. I just posted our email uh, in okay. the chat box there. Okay. And then is that only for are those certain states or it just whatever state 
that homestead it? As, as long as there's a homesteading connection or, or any public land connection, you know, if it's desert land or timber culture, you know, some sort of public land connection, we're happy to share. Okay. And we don't have to own that, still own that land, or do we need to? Okay. Not at all. As, as long as, you know, it's, it's just your family story. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm glad to see you again. It's fun. Nice to see you too. Also, just for the benefit of the, since we're recording today's presentation, uh, the uh, the email address that John just gave in the chat box is home underscore information at nps.gov, nationalparkservice.gov. Thank you. Now, I, I have a question. What was the determining factor of making Beatrice, Nebraska the park location? So that's an excellent question. Uh, the reason we're located here, of course, we talk about homesteading all across the country, right? Uh, but we are on the site of Daniel Freeman's homestead, and he was the first person nationwide to claim land under the Homestead Act. Uh, he got his claim in just after midnight on January 1st, 1863. So basically, as soon as the law took effect, he was in there signing his paperwork. That's a great backstory. Thank you. Now, um, oh, go ahead, Susan, go ahead Wendy. Suzanne, you should see the house too. And John, maybe you can tell a little bit, but how big is the house? It's like 12 by 12, double high with a loft. And how many kids were in there? I mean, it was just incredible. <laughs> yeah, 12 people, mom, dad, and 10 kids in a, a little 12 by 16 cabin. I can't even imagine. Can you, John, can you show a picture of that? Is that handy? Yeah, uh, my screen should be sharing still, right? Yes. Uh, well, no, we're, we're seeing you right now. One second, I will pull up a picture here. And if you can show a picture of what it looks like, it's it's just beautiful up out there and the, the prairie land and everything around it too is really neat. Can you see it? No. Um, one second. There we go. Oh, now we see it. Oh my goodness. Oh, that is small. So if you can imagine 12 people living in that cabin. I assume, presumably it had a loft. It did, yes. So they would sleep in the loft and live downstairs mostly? Uh, my understanding is that the children slept in the loft. Yeah. Yeah, it still wasn't very big. I mean, it, it'd be like sleeping in a tent, like logs right next to each other. You know, um, I think what mom and dad's bed is downstairs with the stove. And I mean, there's just, I mean, you can't even, you know, you can't even swing a baseball bat in there. Um, it's pretty small. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how do we find the park? I mean, because I know a lot of uh, the people in my class, you know, some are retired, you know, some just take vacations. How does one get to the park? So we are about 40 miles south of the state capital of Lincoln. Uh, the, the main highway going through Nebraska is I-80. And if you take I-80 to Lincoln, you then take 77 south, uh, 40 miles, and we're just off of uh, 77 a few miles from Beatrice. And do you need to make reservations in advance to go in the park? Nope. nope. And we are open uh, 362 days a year, uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So we're, we're only closed New Year's Day, uh, Thanksgiving, and Christmas Day. Wonderful. Okay. And and the reason I got to meet Jonathan was um, when I was going down, going to look at this and stop at the homestead, um, you know, they have a big museum area too besides the house. But Jonathan, they have a, you have a link or a, a list of all your, a calendar of all your events. And that's how I got to get there for that presentation. So if you want to go and you kind of pick the time you can go and listen to the presentation. So. John, how long have you been with the Park Service? 
Uh, I've been with the Park Service about five years now. I started off at a park in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, Keweenaw National Historical Park, uh, before coming here in 2019. Okay, class, any other questions for our guest speaker today? I have, I have a question. Um, I'm George from California. Um, I know this doesn't pertain to homesteading, but since we're a genealogy group, I have to ask this. I have um, a Fairchild ancestor in South Carolina named John, Captain John Fairchild. Uh, are you, do you have ancestors from South Carolina by any chance or? So this is a terrible thing to admit in a genealogy group. Uh, but past like my my second great grandparents, I'm not really sure. Oh, okay. uh, so uh, I know of going back to like the 1850s or so, and that would be in um, New Mexico hmm. and Louisiana and Texas. Okay. No hmm. South Carolina that I know of, but you know, and 200 I, I know plus there, years maybe. And I believe there was an early immigrant in Connecticut named Fairchild that I've seen in searching my, that family too. So it's not like there's just one Fairchild family, but I, I just thought, well, I have to ask since I have a Fairchild ancestor in South Carolina in case, in case you'd heard of them or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Jonathan, if you're ever interested in, in pursuing your family history, you know who to reach out to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or come to class. We'll we'll help you with it. <laughs> we'll we'll get that we'll get that tree built for you in no time at all. There you go. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions for our guest speaker today? Just give it a few more seconds. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, uh, Jonathan, I want to say thank you very much uh, for your uh, generous time today and sharing your expertise with the class. And uh, before I say goodbye to our guest speaker, I just want to remind everybody that the class does go on for another couple hours. If you'd like to stay for the second half of class, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you don't want to stay for the second half of class, you can just click that red in button and that'll take you out of the class today. But before you do, if there's anything in the chat box that you want, uh, please download it before you leave because if you try to log back in, you will not have access to the chat box any longer. So uh, once again, uh, Jonathan, thank you very, very much. And at this point in time, I will uh, stop the recording and, and unless you'd like to say goodbye to the class. All right. Well, thank you very much for letting me join you. It's my pleasure. You'll have a great day. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Bye-bye.